Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Novartis Global. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, I'm Kosha Gray, President of the European Atherosclerosis Society and Professor of Public Health and Honorary Consultant Cardiologist the Imperial College London in the United Kingdom. Welcome to this program entitled Reviewing the Latest Data on Lipid Lowering Therapies for ASCVD and What It Means for Practicing Clinicians. Now, to put some context behind this, we need to remember that worldwide there are more than 18 million deaths due to cardiovascular disease every year. And atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is going to be responsible for 85% of these. Recently, it was my privilege to co-chair the World Heart Federation Cholesterol Roadmap, and this has recently been published. And this roadmap built on the 2017 version, and the aim was to reduce the global burden of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease by thinking about cholesterol lowering in a completely different way rather than thinking about hypercholesterolemia, which almost forces you only to manage or think about those people with elevations, but rather thinking about cholesterol lowering throughout the life course as a solution for different stages of atherosclerosis to try and reduce the global burden of ASCVD. A very important distinction. So this article is now freely available. The cholesterol roadmap, is, is there for everybody to download and is a template for implementation. Alongside my co-authors, we basically thought about the biggest challenges in terms of implementation, and we've got to change the narrative. And one of the key things to think about is that we have healthcare systems that really are focused on treating disease and not preserving health. Now, atherosclerosis occurs throughout your lifetime. It's a slow, insidious process. What we really should be focusing on is not simply think about hypercholesterolemia or cholesterol in the blood per se, but cholesterol in the vessel wall, because that is what starts that process of atherosclerosis. And the longer you're exposed to this process, the more severe the amount of cholesterol deposited, the more severe the atherosclerosis, the greater the likelihood of adverse clinical events. So we have to start thinking about time, not as a risk factor, but as an exposure, It's if you like, that period of time you've just failed to intervene. And that's very important for policy, as you will hear. Now, in this program, I'm gonna discuss a little bit more about a holistic approach and how we might think about lipid lowering therapies, not as a necessarily a step-by-step -step approach, but thinking broad brush, thinking long-term, and how this can improve not only future risk of cardiovascular disease, but also try to help healthcare systems better implement appropriate preventative strategies and earlier. So I'm going to start with this, and this is really the, the, the key foundation for the cholesterol roadmap, the eight pillars. Atherosclerosis results from the retention of ApoB containing lipoproteins and their cumulative exposure throughout the lifespan. Now, most of these are going to be LDL particles and the cholesterol cargo. Now, importantly, atherosclerosis is a multifactorial disease. Although the process in the vessel wall is ApoB lipoprotein retention, this can be accelerated by other risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, smoking. It's important to remember that most clinically significant ASCVD events are going to occur in people without extreme elevations. 
Therefore, we have to think about global risk and risk stratification and not simply rely on finding people with abnormal lipids. We need to know that there are some key differences. There are those individuals who clearly have hypercholesterolemia of genetic origin, so FH. This has got a much greater prevalence. One in 311 individuals have this. We need to screen those, probably screen in childhood. And there, if we start treatment early, we can course correct long term. We now know nature doesn't care about how you lower LDL. If you do it through approach one and achieve the same reduction in LDL as with approach B, you get similar benefits. And that's good for us because it means we can add or subtract treatments as needed based upon availability, cost, and tolerability. But it's that combination therapy that we're going to have to use, particularly when we start later. Now, we know that although it's ApoB containing lipoproteins and it's clearly an advantage to use ApoB, LDL and LDL cholesterol is still more commonly used globally. So for now at least, it's still the principal target for treatment, although there is no reason in the future we can't move to ApoB or non-HDL, for example. And the latter is really quite important because the global epidemic of obesity and diabetes means that we are seeing an increasing number of another type of ApoB containing lipoprotein, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. These not only contain triglyceride, but also cholesterol alongside those. So by moving to thinking about non-HDL and ApoB, universally, we can actually better pick those individuals up. And finally, there's another ApoB containing lipoprotein that is genetically determined that you only need to measure once in your life to find it, and that is lipoprotein little a. It fulfills all of the criteria for causality, and there are ongoing studies now looking at lowering this and seeing if that can reduce cardiovascular events. I want to really just think about now the lifetime exposure. So let's say we have two individuals, one, with a 50% higher LDL cholesterol than another. And you can see when we look at these people early, let's say at the age of 30, like a marathon, we can't separate these people out. But over the course of the marathon, they are going to spread out. And the person with the highest lifetime LDL exposure, so the 50% higher lifetime exposure, will have the greatest risk of events. That person with the lower 50% exposure will have the lowest risk. Let's take that person with a high lifetime exposure. I might meet that person at different stages of their life. If I met them at the age of 50, I could course, if I, or if I met them at the age of 60, I could course correct by 50%. But now I would reduce their long-term risk by about 27%. If I met that person age 50 and achieved the same reduction in LDL, I would course correct by about 47%. If I met that person age 30, I would course correct by over 50%. This means we don't need the same approach at different ages because age really reflects the amount of atherosclerosis. So that person that I meet aged 50, let's say, I might want a 50% lowering of LDL, but if I meet that person at an earlier age, say 40, a one third lowering of LDL might be, be sufficient because it's like interest in a bank account or saving into a pension. The longer you maintain that, the better. And that's an important thought process change. You can see here that there are a number of different approaches with combination therapies. And you can see what is achievable in terms of background statin therapy use or non-use in statin intolerant patients. So we should be able to achieve 60 or 80% lowering of LDL cholesterol in statin intolerant patients and anywhere between 35 and 60% in statin intolerant patients, but we're still gonna to have to use combination therapies for those bigger reductions. Let's think about healthcare and let's think about the global distribution. So what you can see here is that out of the approximate 8 billion people in the world, most people are going to be young. They're under the age of 20 or 30. So in the short term, they're not contributing very much to the number of ASCVD events that occur. So if you look at the global distribution of the world by age, those older people who've got much more subclinical or clinical ASCVD, they're the ones that are going to be contributing now to the events that will occur, let's say, in the next five years. So it doesn't make sense to think about those young people in the same way as we do about those older individuals. So for younger people, for example, 
thinking about screening for FH, for lipoprotein little a, will find those people where cholesterol exposure, identifying them early and treating, will basically stop that conveyor belt landing on your doorstep in 50 years' time. On the other hand, we know some of these people will develop lifestyle features that will increase the risk of atherosclerosis. So here, primordial prevention, preventing the determinants of atherosclerosis in the first, of those risk factors later on in the first place will be important. Then there are those 30, 40, 50 year olds where screening, global risk assessment, imaging may help you to identify people on that trajectory for ASCBD. And again, many of these from simple low cost treatments taken daily could reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. So more expensive treatments can now be focused on those with more advanced disease. So now if you look at this approach in the neck, in the, in the bottom part of this slide, what you'll be able to see is over a lifetime, that investment early is going to prevent the greatest burden of events that will occur, the total number of events that will occur. Because we're actually shifting to prevention and preservation of health in those, and for those with more advanced disease, we're treating the disease itself. But we're doing so in completely different ways. And that will allow us to move from a system where the, the vast majority of our healthcare budget is focused on treating disease, gradually switching in time to systems that preserve health. And therefore, our total healthcare expenditure costs may well go down in time. Now, we know that we need different approaches. And central in this approach now are these sRNA-based approaches. And these are being used to target a whole host of different liver proteins. Now, first among these was PCSK9 with inclycerin. And as you know, we've shown in the past that with a dosing regimen of day one, day 90, six monthly thereafter, over 18 months, we could reduce LDL cholesterol by about 52%. What's more important is that window, if you will, between day 90 and day 540. It's a 15 month window, the area under the curve, the time average reduction, which is far more important, is around 50%. If you like, that translates into, with that infrequent dosing schedule, in a population with an LDL of about 104 milligrams per deciliter, you're getting about 54 mg per deciliter lowering of LDL cholesterol, but with this infrequent dosing interval. And what we did is we looked at adverse cardiovascular events, so cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, and stroke. Now, this was based on safety data. These weren't adjudicated, so we can't overinterpret those data. But even with around about 300 events, what we can already see over 18 months, we can see a 25% lower incidence of cardiovascular events. And you can see favorable trends for non-fatal MI and also or for myocardial infarction rather, and for stroke. So this really bodes well for those large ongoing studies, Orion 4 and Victorian 2P. But remember, these studies were over 18 months duration. So the amount of reduction in risk that you expect in relative terms is exactly what you would have expected with wide confidence intervals for this duration of follow-up and the number of events and the number of patients that you studied and also the starting level of LDL. Now we can see that there's consistency of the endpoints whether it's MACE, whether it's fatal and non-fatal MI, or fatal and non-fatal stroke. And we can see this general consistency across the three trials. Orion 9 was essentially an FH study with a smaller number of patients. So this bodes well. So an important question that has arisen is, okay, so what about this long duration of action? Are there any safety signals? Are there any adverse signals that I need to worry about? And is that duration of effect that we see over that 18-month window going to be maintained? Well, what's important is in Orion um, 9, 10, and 11, no individual got more than four doses. That was by design. And there's only a one-year or 15-month window when we're really testing that twice-a-year dosing schedule. So what we had set up before we started those phase three studies is an open label extension 
of our original Orion 1 trial, which was the dose finding study. And to remind you in that study, there were about 180 patients who received a single dose of inclycerin. There were three different doses. And there were about 180 patients who received two doses of inclycerin. There were three different doses. And there were 60 placebo patients in each of those uh, single and double dose comparator groups. Now, at the end of one year, those patients in Orion 1 were invited to come back and continue in an open label extension. Because what that gave us an opportunity to do is to test long term that twice a year dosing schedule to see indeed whether this was maintained. That, period, that short period that we assessed, is that going to be maintained in year two, year three, year four, year five? Also, we have no idea about repeat dosing of the risk complex. This is how inclycerin works and whether that in itself leads to any biological escape. Are there any adverse effects? And this obviously has implications for other sRNA-based therapies in development. So because of the long effect of inclycerin, what we did is those patients with any exposure to inclycerin in Orion 3, they, without a loading dose, just went on to a six monthly or twice a year dosing schedule for another four years. So these are people that already had some exposure to inclycerin. But there were about 120 patients who had no exposure to any PCSK9 lowering therapy. And what they were invited to do was to go into a switching arm. So they all had to consent to this protocol if they wanted to continue. So if you like, Orion 1 patients had to be reconsented and therefore, as a result of the original 496, about 360 continued into this open label extension. Now, in the switching arm, patients first had to have 26 self injected 140 milligram subcutaneous injections of evolocumab. And at the end of one year, what we did is we assessed switch, switching either concurrently, so they got their last dose of evolocumab and inclycerin on the same day, and some were sequential, where they had their last dose of evolocumab about 24 days before, and then they got their inclycerin dose. They had an extra dose, because after the first dose of inclycerin, there was a loading, day 90, but then six monthly thereafter. And what we're able to show, importantly, is in the primary endpoint, which was in the inclycerin-only group, Remember, they got inclycerin in Orion 1 and they continued in Orion 3. At day 210, which is almost one year and nine months from the, the first ever exposure to, to inclycerin, a non placebo corrected reduction in LDL of 47.5%. So, with placebo correction, this would likely have been over 50. And importantly, year one, year two, year three, year four, you were getting very similar reductions. So over a four-year window, what you were able to say is that with essentially eight or nine injections of inclycerin, you are maintaining a 44% reduction in LDL cholesterol. Of the patients that went from evolocumab to inclycerin, because with one approach, you're binding all PCSK9 in blood, and with the second approach, you are shutting down 70% of what is in blood, there was a modest increase in LDL levels. But what you were gaining is going from 26 injections a year to, to two injections a year is essentially maintaining about a 45% lowering of LDL cholesterol just with the much more convenient approach. And there were no extra additional safety signals that we were observed with either type of switch. And the only thing that we already know that with any injectable therapies, a small excess of injection site adverse events of mild to moderate severity, transient usually, that disappear with repeat exposure anyway. So we didn't really see any additional safety signals. Now, it's not just about sRNAs, there are other therapies. So recently, we've seen the Fourier open label extension, and that was important because Fourier followed people up for about two years. The open label extension showed that those people started earlier got greater benefit over about a five-year period 
with even cardiovascular mortality benefits as well. So again, let's recapitulate the use of combination therapy. It's lower, longer. That's the real key mantra. And here we'll also see data on lower LDL with a combination of a PCSK9 monoclonal as well as on a background of statin and with lower on-treatment LDLs being associated with the lowest risk of future cardiovascular events. So everything is pointing to use of combination therapy earlier and longer, particularly for people with more advanced disease. Now we need to shift focus because there's been an interest in triglyceride and triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. We need to remember that triglycerides are contained in APA B containing lipoproteins. And in that regard, the prominent trial has been really very informative because in that trial, Pima fibrate in a large cardiovascular outcome trial reduced triglycerides significantly. And because triglycerides and remnant cholesterol are interrelated, if you divide triglycerides by five, you get the amount of cholesterol that you would believe is carried alongside those particles. That was also lowered. But ApoB actually went up and LDLC actually went up very slightly. And overall, there was no difference in cardiovascular outcomes. So this means that triglyceride lowering is only going to be effective if at the same time you accompany that by changes in ApoB, i.e. you've got to clear the particles which are carrying the triglycerides in the first place. And that becomes relevant to some of the RNA-based therapy approaches with sRNAs that we've seen. Shastas too looked at ApoC3 with an sRNA-based approach and showed that this targeting in the liver with Galnac modification lowered ApoC3, and as a result of that, reduced triglycerides and non-HDL cholesterol concentration, whilst also increasing HDL. And these were in patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia. We know there's another approach that can be tested, this was in ARCHIS2, where an sRNA-based approach against ANGPTL3 was shown to decrease ANGPTL3 levels triglycerides and cholesterol in patients with mixed dyslipidemias. So given the neutral results of the fibrate trial with prominent, these two approaches might hold hope for the future in targeting triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. So I want to pause for a second and just draw on lipoprotein A. I want to refer to the cholesterol roadmap and also the EAS consensus paper on LPA. So we know that LPA elevations are much more common. We know they're fixed throughout your, your life. They go up possibly slightly after menopause in women. And very much like those LDL curves I was, I was talking about earlier on, when you see people with high and low levels of LPA, you can't really separate them out easily over a short time interval. However, if these people are followed up for the next 40 years or so, those people with very high LPA levels will have the highest risk of cardiovascular events. And one of the things we pointed out in the EAS consensus paper was that if you look at these people with different levels of LPA, you've got to think about global risk because it's not just LPA on its own that matters, global risk matters as well. But when you find this, there are different things you could do. You could lower LDL, and if you find these people early, you need less LDL lowering to offset some of the risk. If you find these people late, you need more LDL lowering, so combination therapies. But there will, for those people with still very high levels of LPA, there will still be, after LDL lowering, high residual risk. For those individuals, we have previously not been able to reduce LPA by 80-90%. Now we have antisense oligonucleotides that are being tested in cardiovascular outcome trials. And soon, right behind that, we are seeing sRNA-based approaches. And these will give us the opportunity to have less frequent dosing, for example. And that's been presented, for example, in the OCEAN trial, where we can see a new sRNA with infrequent dosing really giving profound reductions in LPA levels. And we expect these now to go into phase three cardiovascular outcome trials. So LDL lowering remains central. 
and we need to think about using combination therapies and using combination therapies early. That's what the roadmap really teaches you. And we can see that essentially we've got a number of different approaches. We've got a number of oral agents and we've got a couple of different injectable therapies. Some require more frequent dosing, some require less. And that's a great advantage for our patients and shared decision making. So the future is really exciting. And really what is holding us back now is implementing all of these tools in those patients. We need to start with risk assessment and match cholesterol lowering across the life course to level of risk. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.